sorry, in order not to detain everybody, um, uh, we have three great speakers this morning. And if Stephen doesn't mind, if I just go straight to Stephen Kinnock, the MP for Abervan, uh, and our French French spokesperson on foreign affairs with particular responsibility for Hong Kong. Over to you, Stephen. You're all muted. I just you need to unmute yourself. I'm not allowed to unmute myself. Oh, now I am allowed to unmute myself. OK, that's great. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Siobhan. And, uh, and it's really a, a pleasure and an honour to be uh, taking part in this um, discussion today and and to be alongside people such as yourself and, uh, and Ted and, and others who are campaigning so actively and passionately for this cause, which is so important. Um, you know, we're absolutely appalled in the Labour Party uh, by what China has been doing on Hong Kong. It's a devastating assault on the rights and freedoms uh, of the people of Hong Kong and, and of the values that we cherish and, and hold dear. And it sends a very, very worrying signal not just about the specifics of what's happening in Hong Kong, but more broadly, a recent report by Hong Kong Watch referred to Hong Kong as the canary in the coal mine. Uh, and what we are seeing in terms of what the Chinese Communist Party is doing in Hong Kong is, is not just worrying specifically for what's happening there, but what it could mean for the uh, rest of the world and, and for uh, the future of our democracies. Um, we've seen this assault in Hong Kong from judicial independence to free speech, the right to assembly, the national security law represents a very clear and significant erosion of Hong Kong's uh, special autonomous status. It violates the basic law, which of course China itself is signed up to, and it effectively is the end of the one country, two systems principle and and we've seen it being uh, in terms of specific actions that the chinese government has taken uh, how this is being put into practice 53 uh, democracy protesters arrested uh, 38 of whom have been refused bail uh, the dismissal of the four opposition legislators the denial of bail for jimmy lai the treatment of the hong kong 12 the arrest and sentencing of of leaders such as Joshua Wong, Ivan Lam and Agnes Chow, and of course the, the outrageous treatment of, of Ted uh, Wee, who's on this, on this uh, panel and will be, will be speaking. Um, we stand shoulder to shoulder with these brave campaigners and activists, uh, and we will consistently remind the UK government of its unique responsibility and obligations to the Hong Kong people it really is not now the time to look the other way. We also need to do much more to ensure that we are supporting the, uh, those who are gonna to come to our country on the basis of the BNO status, uh, British National Overseas. And I've uh, joined forces with Steve Reid, who is our uh, Shadow Secretary of State for Housing, Communities and Local Government, and Holly Lynch, who is our Shadow Minister for Immigration in writing to Lord Greenhill, who is uh, responsible for the integration of uh, the BNOs into UK society. We're worried that uh, there doesn't seem to be enough support and guidance for local authorities, language support, access to GPs, access to housing, education, university tuition fees. Are conversations really happening between government and civil society? And there's a worrying lack of a sort of joined up working across Whitehall on this. Um, I have to say Lord Greenhill's re reply to me was rather vague and we'll be continuing to press this point and, and, and really making sure that what is a, a, an excellent uh, initiative to um, uh, make this offer to uh, BNO passport holders, what a, what a tragedy it would be really if in the implementation it somehow uh, we, we drop the ball and uh, it, it, the whole thing could potentially backfire if, it, if it's not properly handled by um, the government. We need to ensure that the route 
uh, to uh, clear, a clear path to citizenship is offered uh, to those who were born after 1997, of course, the Youth Mobility Scheme. And it's right, the Youth Mobility Scheme is, is really vague on whether or not this could potentially lead to a path to citizenship. So that's another issue that we're pressing. But, you know, those are the issues, the, the initiatives that have been offered around offering a lifeboat. Um, but, you know, really we need to be doing far more to actually stand with those who are in Hong Kong and who are planning to remain in Hong Kong in order to fight for democracy and freedom. We must stand shoulder to shoulder with them. And we've been bitterly disappointed by the UK government's failure to really take tangible action. For example, Magnitsky sanctions. Well, we finally got Magnitsky sanctions on uh, senior uh, Chinese officials who've been orchestrating the uh, human rights abuses that we're seeing in Xinjiang against the Uyghur people. But the, not a single Hong Kong official has been included on the Magnitsky sanctions, uh, whereas in the United States, for example, dozens of Hong Kong officials have been sanctioned. So we have no explanation from the government as to why this uh, has not been done. We need an independent judge led inquiry into police brutality towards pro-democracy protesters. Uh, we've seen the use of pepper spray, water cannon and utterly disproportionate measures. The UK government's been completely silent on this issue. We believe that it's, the time is now up for British judges serving in Hong Kong. Uh, you may have seen the recent announcement that the, the Labour Party is shifting its position on this. We believe now that the British judges are simply lending a veneer of legitimacy and credibility to, what, to a system that is fundamentally broken by the actions of the Chinese government undermining the rule of law and by continuing to serve in Hong Kong, British judges are simply uh, just lending legitimacy to a fundamentally illegitimate system, and that needs to stop. And we've seen silence from the UK government on the actions of uh, big financial institutions such as HSBC coming out in support of the national security law. Uh, and why isn't the UK government speaking out more uh, vocally on, on that issue? Um, and I think many of these questions I'm asking about why is the UK government not doing more comes back to the absence, and this is my, what I would say in conclusion really, the absence of a China strategy. Uh, we accept that there are areas where we must cooperate with China, particularly on climate change and on dealing with global pandemics. We accept that there are areas where we should be competing far more, particularly on, for example, our technology base, having a proper industrial strategy, dealing with things like China's almost monopolistic position on uh, rare earth uh, minerals, which are, uh, me rare earth metals, which are playing such a vitally important role in the modern economy. Uh, but there also has to be a clear strategy around challenging and taking an adversarial position with regard to China in terms of uh, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law in, in Hong Kong uh, and elsewhere, we're profoundly concerned as well about the saber rattling in the South China Sea and what that might mean for Taiwan. But because we've got different parts of the UK government working almost against each other, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. We know that the Chinese Communist Party respects strength, weak, strength consistency and unity and is utterly contemptuous of weakness and division. So we need a strong, robust uh, China strategy that was lacking from the integrated review that was recently announced by the government. And uh, until we have that, I'm afraid that we're going to see the lack of action uh, on issues like Hong Kong that I've just been uh, outlining. Uh, so uh, my final re request really and urging for the UK government would be to develop this uh, proper, robust China strategy. Uh, and I'll end with that, uh, Siobhan, and I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you for all you're doing uh, to make sure that uh, Labour uh, is putting uh, the case for Hong Kong. Um, we're going to take questions at the end of all the contributions. Um, and if anybody has a uh, question, if you'd like to put type it into the uh, chat box, um, we can then go through them right at the very end. A few other um, uh, housekeeping issues. Um, the reason why we're using WebEx 
uh, is due to security uh, concerns with Zoom. Um, we're asking that everybody keeps their microphones on mute and directs questions, as I said, through the written chat function, uh, which we will aim to address um, after all our speakers have finished. Um, the webinar will be recorded by the White House Consultancy um, and the full contents of this web web webinar will be published uh, on the White House Consultancy's website. Uh, you also have permission uh, to use the full recording as marketing material. Please do feel free to post on your social media channels, websites and share with your net, uh, networks uh, should this uh, be something that you want to do. Uh, my name is Siobhan McDonough um, and I'm the MP for Mitchum and Morden and I'm Vice Chair of the APPG on Hong Kong. Um, as we just heard from Stephen Kinnock, who's our Shadow Minister for Asia, that's Labour when I say our, uh, as Shadow Minister for Asia uh, and the Pacific. Um, uh, uh, we also are delighted to be able to have Ted Huey, Huey, former member of the Hong Kong Legislative Council, who will be our next speaker. Um, and he was among the 19 pan Democrats who resigned en masse in November 2020 from the Legislative Council. Uh, Ted is currently re uh, residing in Australia to continue his lobbying efforts. Um, our third uh, speaker will be Fotan, Fight for Freedom, Stand with Hong Kong. Uh, Fotan is a spokesperson of Fight for Freedom, Stand with Hong Kong, an independent grassroots crowdfunded advocacy group consisting of individuals who have come together to fight for freedom and democracy for Hong Kong. Um, so I'd like to now introduce you to our next speaker, Ted Huey. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you everyone for having me. And uh, it's my honor and I treasure the opportunity to share the situation in Hong Kong and also to state Hong Kong's case. And so it's just a very brief introduction of myself. And um, I've been a legislator for the past four years uh, in Hong Kong's legislature. And I also served uh, at the district level as a Hong Kong politician for 10 years. So uh, I would say what's special about me, uh, of course, is that I have firsthand experience uh, of confronting uh, the Hong Kong regimes. I participated in uh, street protests as peacemaker negotiators. So I've tried the hard way of confronting the CCP regimes. I also have uh, experience of the soft way because I've spent years in the parliament uh, deliberating, negotiating, uh, with CCP regimes, trying soft ways, uh, but of course, in both ways to no avail. So I've been on exiles. Uh, it's my third month now. So I've exiled myself in Denmark for, for days, uh, in the UK for the past three months. And I just arrived at Australia and staying here for a longer term. So uh, at the time I left Hong Kong, I was facing uh, nine criminal charges and of course, under investigations uh, under the national security law. So if I go back to Hong Kong, it's almost for certain that I'll be I'll be in jail uh, for if if not for life for decades. So uh, I'm lucky to be here uh, speaking to you. Or otherwise, if I didn't leave Hong Kong, I would be in jail in in Stanley, Hong Kong, definitely. So I'm a fine example of what uh, dissidents are facing in Hong Kong. So now I'm, I've given myself a new role and new responsibility and keep lobbying for Hong Kong's case and state Hong Kong's uh, story and also get the Hong Kong diaspora uh, in, uh, developed and organized globally. So firstly, um, uh, the UK, of course, has a unique responsibility uh, to Hong Kong's situation. And uh, I would say that Hong Kong should be at the most uh, forefront should be uh, number one, be the front man uh, to speak for Hong Kong uh, for, for two reasons. Of course, legally, because of the Sino-British declarations, which the Chinese uh, CCP regimes would call it historicals and bears no more meanings and that the UK shouldn't be meddling with Hong Kong anymore. Of course, they would say that. But uh, the fact is, legally, it's uh, uh, 
international treaty registered in, under US and it's enforceable and it's a legal international obligations of the UK uh, to take care of Hong Kong. And it's because of uh, the declarations that led to the basic law, the mini constitution that Hong Kong uh, has now. And this is the reason why quite many Hong Kongers uh, have the confidence uh, to state when it's when, to, going back to the 80s, when we are, we are about to be handed back to China. So we gain confidence uh, from the promises made under uh, the, the uh, uh, basic law and the sign of British declarations. And of course, morally, um, not to uh, mention that uh, Hong, uh, the, the British governed Hong Kong for 165 years in the past, and not to mention, of course, the benefits that uh, it's been uh, the UK has uh, taken. But more importantly, how how the British in the past shaped Hong Kong uh, with freedom, at least, even though it wasn't democracy, but Hong Kong people were given a high higher degree of freedoms and equipped Hong Kong with rule of law, independent judiciary, and the ICAC, Independent Commission Against Corruptions, and shaped Hong Kong uh, as to become what it is now. So we, we are grateful for that. And um, we are also grateful as Hong Kongers how uh, HK has been strong against the CCP and has spoken uh, for Hong Kong's freedom and democracy like many of you did. And I am grateful that for the efforts, especially for the BNO visa schemes tailor-made for Hong Kongers, given, given Hong Kongers a lot of certainties when they need a safe place to go to. And I'd, I'd like to stress that why Hong Kong is important when human rights violations are everywhere. It's also in Burma, it's also in Xinjiang, and it's also, also in Belarus. I'd say that Hong Kong's freedom is also the world's freedom. And because Hong Kong is at the forefront of the freedom battles between uh, the, the freedom camps and the authoritarian camps. And uh, more importantly, Hong Kongers are still struggling. We have not given up. So we just need a hand, a great hand, and a lot of hands uh, from international communities so that we can fight on. So if the free countries win Hong Kong's freedom back, it, it's a, the meaning of it is that the freedom camp prevails over the tyrannies. So um, I believe that there are quite a list of things that uh, UK uh, can put more efforts into and more can be done. Firstly, of course, as Mr. Keynote mentioned, sanctions. And I, I understand that it's a, cross, a cross party consensus in, in your parliament, but uh, it's very hard for me to uh, comprehend. And it's, I think it's also the sentiment of quite many Hong Kongers, uh, why sanctions are not there yet. And of course, we've seen sanctions uh, over uh, Xinjiang uh, government officials uh, followed by uh, ones uh, made by, by the EU, and but why not Hong Kong? When police brutality is uh, self-evident, when people are going to jails, we we are we have we do have high hopes that it it will come anytime soon, any moment. And and from my point of view, when we talked of the special responsibility that UK bears historically, legally, and morally. Uh, I believe there's no reason for the UK government to be behind EU in terms of sanctioning uh, Hong Kong officials. So I, I I agree that the UK can take the lead, and of course for the EU and for the rest of the world to follow suit. Of course, that we we need more pressures uh, from uh, people like you and from civil society, uh, from the opposition. And I would be happy, and it would uh, it, it would be my honour. If uh, uh, parliamentary uh, inquiry procedures or, or sessions can be made for Hong Kong and for perhaps also for Xinjiang, uh, for uh, Hong Kong and and the Uyghur diaspora uh, to testify uh, firsthand to state Hong Kong's and Xinjiang's case, and that would be also of use and of uh, attentions internationally. So I hoping that uh, that can be one option for uh, for parliamentarians uh, to be considering. And of course, uh, Mr. Kino also mentioned BNO schemes. 
definitely uh, now it's, uh, I would say it's generous and I, I'm grateful that many Hong Kongers have a safe place, safe haven to go to uh, under serious persecution now in Hong Kong. But for the young ones, for the young protesters, uh, the only options would be still asylum, not to be any schemes, because they are too young. They lack the resources and uh, they, they, they lack uh, money uh, to study and they, they are not mature enough to work here. So uh, there's, there won't be uh, tens of thousands of them, but there, are, there can be hundreds of them. They definitely need uh, an immediate place to go to. So I, I, I also wish that on the asylum route, uh, more privileges can be given to them, considering uh, what they're facing, and it's it, it's a re real hardship that they have. And many of them already landed the UK and waiting for that, and quite desperate, I would say. I've contacted them, talked to them, so I hope more consideration can be done on that. Of course, I we are also pushing forward. I personally I, uh, believe that U UK judges shouldn't sit in Hong Kong's Court of Final Appeal anymore, because the erosion of uh, the collapse, I would say, of the rule of law and judicial independence is self-evident. With a national security law, the administration of Hong Kong can interfere with judicial decisions. For example, uh, the chief executive can handpick judges to listen to political cases and exclude others that they don't trust. So this is uh, very serious. And also the national security law changed fundamentally uh, some very important common law principles, uh, for example, um, the presumption of innocence. Uh, that's why quite many of us are in jail now. So finally, I would also advocate for more support from on the UK government, the UK parliament and the UK civil society uh, to support uh, the Hong Kong diaspora that would be vibrant, that would be quite uh, massive uh, in terms of number in the UK. And uh, it's especially important because I would say that amongst the many Hong Kong diasporas and Hong Kongers communities overseas, the UK ones uh, will be the most powerful because it will be the first priority for the for the wave of uh, dissidents uh, fleeing from Hong Kong as the first priority because of the generous BNO schemes. So they will be the most determined they will be the most uh, willing to be organized and to take part in uh, international lobbying and to also to take part to contribute to the UK communities. So uh, if the society, the UK society can give full support to uh, that Hong Kong diaspora to build up civil, uh, civil society, cultural assimilations, and that will be of great use uh, for the Hong Kong move and to fight on and to keep uh, the Hong Kong freedom movements the momentums. So these are my suggestions and the things that can be done. And I, I hope that uh, uh, it can be considered and more uh, to be to be done on the UK's part. I'm happy to take more questions uh, after what uh, the, the last speaker speaks. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ted. Thank you for your clarity and your bravery. We 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 all really uh, admire you. Um, and to our um, Final, uh, last but not least, speaker, Fotan, uh, who is a representative of Fight for Freedom, Stand with Hong Kong. Over to you, Fotan. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so, thank you so much uh, for being uh, with us today. I think uh, certainly Hong Kong has been a, a hot topic, it's been going for more than a year, and I think now that we are in this kind of a a bottleneck moments that we're asking ourselves what can we do more and particularly um for labor supporters labor party members what can you what kind of role that you can play uh, to support hong kong and as mr hoy was saying um, um which I, I i agree with him precisely that we're now in a very uh, interesting time because of the national security law and because of what's uh, going on in hong kong that China has changed completely uh, how Hong Kong is being governed. One country to system is gone. Common law, the concept of common law, it's 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 gone. So Hong Kong is no longer an autonomous uh, special administrative region, and 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 we are seeing a systematic uh, repressive uh, 
the programs are happening in Hong Kong that are prosecuting uh, political events. So we see that you know Mr. Hoi is now in exile because of of so many unfair charges on him. And then of course we see, we know that the forty seven uh, uh, democracy activists are now being uh, charged uh, as national security uh, security crimes. And so so what we are seeing now is we're seeing a lot of people are moving away from Hong Kong. Some of them have no trust, and a lot of them will be coming to the UK uh, with the Vienna visas. I think particularly, um, as Mr. Hui was saying about, uh, we need to pay uh, extra attention on uh, young Hong Kongers who are applying asylum. So I think that the Labour Party can play a vital role in ensuring that the government is now reviewing its immigration policy. The government is due to announce um, it's uh, a rehaul of the asylum policy. I think I do agree with the fact that the asylum policy has been unchanged for many years, and, and it certainly doesn't. Uh, uh, it's not a very flexible system. And I think I think there's so many conversations on how you can make the system better. And I think Labour would pay would pay, uh, play a very very important role in scrutinising the government, making sure that, that the asylum policy is a humane one, is a policy that is good for uh, people who need it, and particularly on, from my perspective as the representative of, of Samuel Hong Kong, how can that system uh, going to help uh, young Hong Kongers? Because the BNO scheme is generous, and I'm very uh, grateful to that, and I'm certainly feeling very um, uh, energetic about, you know, the the, the possibilities of Hong Kongers coming to the UK. But we must remember that many, many brave protesters, they were born after the Hanover. And they don't necessarily uh, all of them be able to move with their parents. So there are a substantial amount, probably as, as Mr. Hui was saying, about hundreds, hundreds of them will be um, sort of, you know, in this gap. And they they won't be covered by anything, and 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 they will be trapped in you know our, our asylum, the UK asylum systems, which I'm sure many of you will know that it's not a very pleasant thing. So I think that's one thing that we must uh, work on uh, together to build consensus to make sure the government is doing the right thing. And um, the second thing I think, um, particularly from the Labour perspective, I think the Labour Party will play uh, will play a very important role is to steer the conversation that we need. A comprehensive China strategy. We all know that China is a big threat, and we, we know that we can't ignore the atrocities that China is doing in Xinjiang area and the blatant uh, disregard of international treaty obligations to Hong Kong. This is outrageous and it's barbaric. But the reason why we have to think twice or sometimes inaction, because we also know how important China is. And perhaps it is getting to a point that it's so powerful that one country, UK alone, or even America alone, can't just do something to stop what China is doing. So we need to have a very, very comprehensive policy to deal with China. How can we address the threats posed by China? How can we work with China? How can we be firm on issues that we have hold dear to? And most importantly, how can we, British government and British public, live up the promise and the moral obligations to Hong Kongers? So I think I'm going to finish the point in saying that there's so much that, that needs to be done. And Labour, I believe, will play a very, very vital role in steering that conversation, in making sure that both sides of the House, both sides of the benches, will be on these issues and united for this. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Fotan, and thank you for the clarity in which you've uh, explained to all of us how we can help. I'm just going to move to um, questions now, um, and I'm going to take questions in groups of three. Uh, and uh, so, members of the panel, the first three questions are, this uh, first one is from Stella. What do Hong Kong campaigners hope will happen in 2047 when the one country, two systems ends? And from Harpel, uh, we touched on this, I think uh, Ted touched on this and so did Stephen. What do you think of the British judges being part of the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal? Should they stay 
or go. And finally, from Oscar, what do the panel think ordinary British people can do in cities like mine of Newcastle to make BNOs and younger people seeking asylum feel welcome? So uh, that's uh, about 2047. Uh, what happens then? Uh, British judges, yes or no? And finally, how do citizens make BNO applicants and asylum uh, seekers welcome? Uh, who would like to start? Ted, I saw you. Yeah, please. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, let me start with uh, the question regarding the UK judges. I mentioned, I already stated my position that uh, UK judges uh, shouldn't be sitting there anymore in Hong Kong courts. And I've also mentioned that it's because judicial independence is almost gone now, if not completely. And uh, still, when British judges are, are there, they can be easily excluded from hearing some particular cases, political cases. And then, but then if they stay silent as judges, of course they need to, not getting involved in politics, then it will be a false um, legitimacy are uh, given by, uh, to, to the existing regimes, uh, the existing judicial systems, as if uh, business as usual, as if the national security law is okay, acceptable, uh, when it's totally uh, crushed uh, the rule of law of Hong Kong. So um, the fact that they're staying, uh, of, they cannot do any good because they can easily be excluded and it's a false legitimacy. And on 2047, and I think it's a bit early uh, to imagine that, and that might not be uh, the first question that we need to answer. Because at that time, uh, if Hong Kong was uh, strong enough, in it, if international uh, supports uh, are strong enough, uh, it, uh, the CCP regimes might be forced to be to give up and. And to depend, uh, to to step up from power and to give freedom back to Hong Kong, it's one possibility. Of course, we can we can lose totally, and and all everyone's sent to jails, and freedom is completely gone. So it's too far away to consider that. But for the Hong Kong diaspora, from my point of view, uh, that's only one goal is to defend what we have left now, uh, the little freedoms that uh, we still are struggling with and to restore back to Hong Kong where it was before and even uh, with fighting for full democracy. I think that's only one goal now, whether CCP should be completely defeated, should be gone, should be uh, uh, dissolved, or whether one country, two systems can still exist and we go back to where we were. I, I think it's too early to, to answer. And so, uh, what can normal citizens do? I, I believe I, I, I mentioned in my speech, um, uh, cultural integration uh, would be and, and taking welcoming uh, the Hong Kong diaspora uh, into civil society in the UK would be would be important because I would say that un unlike other Hong Kongers uh, communities overseas, uh, the Hong Kong diaspora in in the UK would have a huge determination. Uh, to fight on for Hong Kong, and then perhaps one day they they wish to go home if if Hong Kong is free. So uh, with with that in heart, of course they will contribute to the UK community, but at the same time, uh, they they need to be uh, taken care of and to be more integrated in this the communities. They need to, the community support um, I, I, a bit more than uh, normal uh, Hong Kong communities overseas. And that would be my answers for now. Thank you, Ted. And um, over to you, Stephen. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Siobhan. I, I think my answer to that first question about 2047 is the famous quote, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. And I am a Democrat. I am an internationalist. And I would not be doing uh, the job that I'm doing unless I believed that in the end, uh, human nature is cooperative, 
and it is it it wants justice and it wants peace and reconciliation and uh, whilst some might feel that that is a naive point of view i i hold it very strongly and passionately and and my opinion is of the chinese communist party that it is an authoritarian regime that has been extremely successful uh, in terms of integrating China into the world economy, lifting millions of people out of poverty. But there will come an inflection point. There will come a tipping point where the people of China want something else. They want freedom. They want the ability to express themselves. They want the uh, ability to elect their leaders. I, I believe that, and I believe that that point uh, can come. Um, it is not at all something that can ever be imposed from the outside. It has to be organic. It has to be built from the inside, but with the increasing interdependence and interconnectedness of the world in which we live, uh, I think that that is uh, a, 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 a global trend, the tectonic plates of our world shifting all the time. And I think that part of the reason that the, the regime of President Xi is acting in the way it is, is from a position of insecurity about being very concerned about the uh, implications of opening up the Chinese economy and, uh, and the interaction that that leads to with other parts of the world and what that could mean for the long term future of the Chinese Communist Party. So the answer, I think, is we'll see 2047 is a long way off. But my my fervent hope is that by the time we get to 2047, we will be in a much better place than we are now. UK judges, the Labour Party's position is absolutely clear. Quite recently, we reached this position. I'm very pleased that we did, that we believe that British judges should no longer serve in Hong Kong. We are absolutely clear on that point. We are urging the government to have the same uh, moral clarity about this. And fundamentally, this is this whole issue we're talking about today is about moral clarity. And I, I increasingly feel that there is a, a shameful lack of moral clarity from uh, the, the British government on, on many of these points. Uh, in terms of welcoming BNOs, well, we've written to Lord Greenhill. Uh, it, perhaps if the person who raised that question would like to contact me, I'd be very happy to share a copy of our letter and his reply, which sets out many of our concerns about the lack of coordination between central government and local authorities. I would certainly recommend, I think you said you came from Newcastle, uh, contacting New, uh, Newcastle Council and asking them what conversations they've had with the UK government about integrating and welcoming BNOs when they come to Newcastle and what you could potentially do to help. And we'd certainly be very interested in hearing what the answers to those questions are because we are worried about the lack of coordination and lack of strategy that we're seeing from the centre. Thank you very much, Siobhan, back to you. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, Oscar was the person who asked about uh... Uh, help reaching out and helping uh, people from Hong Kong coming over. Um, and I would always say that it's always the churches that tend to be in the forefront of holding their hand out to uh, people new to the UK. And I'm sure that Newcastle will have some very thriving faith communities who, who will be involved. Um, Fotan, over to you. Thank you. Um, yes, I think perhaps I would just uh, take on the, the questions from, from Oscar and perhaps expand a bit more. Uh, I mean, particularly, I think, you know, I, I, exactly as, as I agree with what Ms. Kinnock was saying, it, it's important that you talk to your local council. So if you're involved in the local party, if you're involved in, in, in local politics, it's so important that you talk to your local council, uh, talk to your local councillors, talk to your or different organisations locally and see uh, whether they, they are, have planned for uh, welcoming Hong Kongers. And as far as I know, uh, a lot of people think that Hong Kongers are uh, probably going to move to London, but uh, as it happens, I think I actually uh, heard that a lot of people are moving uh, to the very beautiful north of England, and I think there are uh, really some families being settled in Castle and, and the area. So I think it's it's very important that we uh, welcome them, and particularly uh, how the civil society can take an active part. Um, I think that there's another point that perhaps uh, we can pay attention to is, you know, we see that hate crime 
uh, uh, against uh, East Asians, uh, Chinese looking people is increasing. And that is certainly very worrying. And, and I think we, we must send a very um, united and to show solidarity that, that we do not tolerate racism. And I think giving that uh, extra layer of confidence uh, to these new immigrants uh, arriving from Hong Kong really give them a peace of mind. And I think I would encourage everyone uh, to speak to your local council. A lot of governments have been working on a welcome committee. And I know that uh, there is a very good initiative uh, started by uh, uh, Krish. Um, I forgot his name, sorry, but uh, it was welcome churches. So, so the local churches have been doing uh, uh, work to welcome Hong Kongers, but of course, they're, you know, we are expecting more to come, and particularly uh, with a, you know, when we recover from a pandemic, and there will be other uncertainties. We want to make sure that uh, this is a, a, a cohesive a process, and, and and then communication with the local community. It's so important to ensure that we are delivering this uh, good scheme uh, in a good way. Uh, thank you, Fotan. I've got we've got around time for one more round of questions. Um, and uh, Max Wilson asks, why do you think the government is yet to introduce sanctions on Hong Kong officials? Can the UK still have a productive political and economic relationship with China while standing up for human rights and the rule of law in Hong Kong? And finally, what opportunities does the upcoming G7 summit bring to an international approach to standing up to China? Um, and Fotan, do you want your first go this time? Thank you, yes. Um, I think perhaps I would just go on the, um, the in terms of whether it's, um, it's, 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 it's possible uh, a productive uh, a political uh, relationship with China while standing up for human rights. If I'm being completely honest, I I think it is a challenge in a way that you know, most people will say that uh, we have to work with China, we have to work on particularly, let's say, on climate change. I think it is true, you can't ignore and you can't, you, you can't cut ties with China. But I think China is very smart because China knows that you rely on the supply chain, you rely on their investment, you rely on the students, you know, international students, you rely on the money. And because they know that so well, and they know how to play to their advantage. And in that case, China is not a very flexible regime. And, and, and particularly on Hong Kong, on, on Xinjiang, on Weber, these issues, these are what they call a red line, red tape issues, that they're, they're not going to um, stand back, but they're not going to make any concession to that. So given UK position as co signatory of the joint declaration, UK has to stand very firmly on Hong Kong. And given that unique position, it, I cannot imagine that other plans will go as smooth as, as perhaps some people um, would think, because, you know, I, I would like to see, obviously, you know, more corporations in, in other areas. But I think the, the, this is a political reality question that we need to ask ourselves. Is it possible to do that? There might be a way to, to, to get around with it, but my, 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 my impression is, is if we're being completely realistic, it would just get harder and harder. And perhaps sometimes we, we do have to make an option that where we choose, do we place our values on, 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 our, on our moral standing or do we sacrifice that for economic gains? Thank you, uh, Fotan. Uh, Stephen, if I come to you now, it's about um, why do you think the government is yet to introduce sanctions? Can the UK work with China uh, while standing up for human rights and the rule of law? And what opportunities does the upbringing G7 give us? Yeah, th thanks, uh, Siobhan. I, I actually think all of those questions are um, answerable with one word, really, which is strategy. Uh, and until you have a strategy which deals with the complexity of China, the uh, extent to which China impacts on pretty much every aspect of our politics and economy and society, from foreign policy to defense, to education, uh, to uh, technology, 
uh, to security more broadly, um, you are not going to have an answer to those questions about sanctions, about being able to stand up to China whilst also being able to cooperate with China. And, you know, a lot of this is going to come to a head with the G7 uh, in June, which is an absolutely outstanding opportunity for the UK to so show some leadership. So what we need is a strategy which is, is driven by two things, I think. One is reducing our dependence on China. You know, 57 of the UK's critical national infrastructure lines are exposed to uh, Chinese supply chains. Uh, just look at the, the crisis we had over personal protective equipment um, last year at the height of the, the coronavirus crisis, because so much of that equipment, 40% of the world's PPE is produced in China. We also have the issue of the Belt and Road Initiative, which is leading to a kind of debt trap diplomacy where countries all over the world are, are keeping their mouths shut when it comes to criticizing Chinese policies because they're getting vast sums of money in terms of loans and infrastructure development and, and that's the quid pro quo and that's because the international community has been naive and complacent and asleep at the wheel in terms of withdrawing from large parts of Africa uh, from uh, large parts of Asia, you know, you look at countries like Pakistan with vast amounts of um, infrastructure dependent on uh, Chinese uh, Belt and Road finance. So the, the international community needs to come together uh, and, and the UK should be taking a lead on that in G7, talking about how we can pool our resources and be far more effective in terms of reducing our dependence on China and, and doing that across the world. And a big part of that, the second pillar of the strategy, has to be about building alliances. And I have to say, um, I'm, I'm so worried about the UK becoming increasingly isolated. Whatever people's opinion about Brexit, the reality is that we've spent the last five or six years burning bridges, burning our relationships with key allies uh, in continental Europe. And, and that's made the alliance building process very difficult as well. There's no way that we can stand alone uh, against a, a, a giant, a political and economic giant like China. So we need to build alliances, we need to reduce our dependence, and then we need to be prepared to challenge, because actually by challenging, you create more mutual respect. The, the sanctions that came, took out came out yesterday against officials in Xinjiang. What's really interesting, I think, is the Chinese have retaliated, and they have sanctioned 10 EU officials. What that shows to me is, that they do actually care. They could have just ignored it. They could have said, oh, who cares about Magnitsky sanctions in the EU? And these people are irrelevant to us anyway. Um, you know, it's just you know, like a giant elephant swatting a fly off. Uh, but actually they do care and it does get to them. And that shows that it, take, it actually can create, uh, uh, yeah, this might be counterintuitive, but I think successful diplomacy is based on creating an atmosphere of mutual respect. And if one side is consistently weak and appeasing the other side, that doesn't create mutual respect, that just opens the door to more abuses, violations and breaches of law and diplomatic convention. So that, that's where I think there's a false narrative about if you challenge, you can't cooperate. I actually think the opposite is true. The more we challenge, the more robust and strong we are, the more we'll be able to cooperate effectively on, uh, on other areas. Uh, that's, that would be my view on those three points. Thank you, Siobhan. Thank you, Stephen. Um, uh, over to, and so if I take, finally um, take you, Ted, uh, so that would be about why isn't the British government introducing sanctions? Uh, can the UK still have a relationship with China while standing up for human rights and the rule of law? And what opportunities do the G7 bring? But I'd also, um, Oh, I'm sorry there. I thought we had um, a further question, but I can't see it now. But, but Ted, over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll try to be brief. I know time's limited. And for the, quest, uh, for the first questions, why sanctions are in place, I, I'd also like to ask why. And it's hard for me uh, to be speculating on it, but uh, I would be thinking perhaps would that be about the investment interest uh, with the business sector in Hong Kong and uh, with the UK's investment in Hong Kong, there are companies like Swire, Dave Civic, and 
it be their interest and, and that's in also in UK's interest that the government is still considering. But then if that's the case, uh, I think uh, this thought uh, is obsolete because uh, human rights prevails. And when more and more dissidents go to jail and less lesser and lesser freedom left in Hong Kong, I, I don't see any prospect of UK investment or any investments in Hong Kong would be sustainable in the long term and they would put themselves into danger as well. As the questions of uh, the economic relationship that uh, the UK between UK and, and Beijing, I would say now with Beijing taking human rights situation to the to the extremes, nothing can be normal between our uh, free countries and and Beijing. So I I noticed and um, that there's still a bilateral uh, investment treaty between the UK and and Beijing that was signed in, in the 80s, 1986. And if you look at that, uh, the content of that piece of inter international treaties, there's no reference as to uh, any rights, uh, labor rights. It's, there's no reference as to sustainable development, no reference as to social uh, ESG issues, human rights, uh, property, and of course, no, no reference as to environmental aspects. So I believe it would be uh, the UK, is at, at least I, I propose to, to the Labour's, uh, that it should be the, uh, in the positions of pushing forward a, a thorough review uh, by the government regarding uh, the treaties and whether the, uh, and the feasibility of amending it uh, and uh, putting more uh, uh, stresses and, on human rights issues and uh, use it as a clear stance uh, towards China that uh, it's you're taking up human rights situation more seriously, or or there will be uh, consequences even on uh, the economic side. I, I believe that that's something uh, needed to be done. Um, thank you, thank you very much, Ted. Uh, this draws our meeting to a close. Um, I'd like to thank Stephen Kinnock, Ted Huey, and Fotan for their contributions, which I'm sure uh, we will all be thinking about. Um, throughout the day. Um, I would like to thank um, uh, Stand with Hong Kong and the White House Consultancy for organising the event. Um, if you would like to ask any questions or points you'd like to raise, or if you might like to get more involved, then please email standwithhk at whitehouseconsulting.co.uk. Thank you very much to everybody who has attended this morning and for your interest in this vital issue. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.